There we go. Uh, so thank you so much for joining me um, this morning for our September member folklore program. Uh, please let me know if there's any issues, if, if you can't hear me or something like that, and I'll definitely work to resolve those. Um, I hope that everyone has a cup of apple cider, tea, or coffee that they can enjoy while listening to the tales. Before delving into the first story, Garage door is open. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, someone's coming. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, well, before delving into the first story, I want to discuss what folklore is and emphasize that it is not a static um, or a past event. Folklore continues to be created as people share and create new traditions. They respond to social and cultural events and interpret various actions. The term folk identifies a group of people that share one common factor, and folklore can be expressed in numerous ways, whether it's myths, urban legends, fairy tales, uh, graffiti, song, dance, recipes, internet memes, and you can even consider it the writing that you find in public restrooms right on the wall. This broad depth allows us to study culture and people in numerous ways, and folklorists study how those cultural expressions can be linked to political, religious, ethnic, regional, and other forms of group identity. Uh, in our first tale, we meet Molly Cottontail. She first appeared in Joel C. Harris's collection of Black American folk tales, which he began publishing in 1881 involving a character named Uncle Remus. As with many oral traditions, a trickster character appeared, a figure that succeeded by either outsmarting or outwitting a more powerful opponent. While these were fanciful adventures, um, often involving a cast of animals, these tales demonstrated how less powerful persons, such as the enslaved, could overcome more powerful agents, such as slave owners. The trickster character allowed people to fight back indirectly in oral traditions and literature, and we actually see the trickster evolving over time as it responded to new challenges in different cultural, social, and economic conditions. Molly Cottontail appeared as Briar Rabbit's girlfriend, and you can see the novel that used many established figures along with new ones. In the tale, Molly Cottontail steals Mr. Fox's butter. We see her outwitting the male figures. So I'm gonna go ahead and read that now. Aunt Nancy, said Janie, do you know how many more stories about Miss Molly Cottontail? I think she's almost as smart as Mr. Hare, and I like to hear about her almost as much. Almost as smart, almost as smart. Well, if that'll beat all, said Nancy, throwing up her hands in affection of indignant surprise. Let me tell you that when a woman starts out to be tricky, she can beat a man every time because her mind works a heap faster and she sees all around and over and underneath and on both sides of a thing while he's trying to stare plumb through it. Didn't you say she was his wife, asked Ned? I should think they would have called her Mrs. Hare anyways instead of Molly Cottontail. Why do you suppose they didn't? Lord, honey, she answered, I don't come asking me such little foolish questions as that. How do you reckon I'm going to know all the whys and where ofs of all the old time doings? I can't specify the reason of her being called Molly Cottontail sometimes, but it comes to me just now that maybe the married women didn't take their husbands' names in those days like they do now. Anyhow, I know she's called Miss Molly Cottontail and not just wholly and solely the wife of Mr. Hare. She isn't the sort of woman to settle down and be just plain Mrs. Hare all her days and stay home and listen to the children cry and wash their faces and comb their hairs year in and out. Miss Molly got too much get up and go in her for that. She makes old man Hare stay at home and mind the children now and then, and he doesn't dare to say no either. Let me see, now where was I? If I'm going to tell you any more tales, you mustn't come at me that away with questions, unless you want to put the tales out of my head. I just had my mouth fixed to tell you one when you broke in on me about the name. Let's see, what was that tale about anyhow? Well, I asked you for another one about Miss Molly Cottontail, said Janie, so maybe it was about her. Sure enough, said Aunt Nancy. 
Apparently I'm getting feeble in the mind as well in the joints to go for getting that. Yes, the tale was about one time when Miss Molly and Mr. Fox go to make a visit to Mr. Fox's brother who lived across the swamp and down in the hollow. He was right friendly with her about that time and invited her to go with him. She was all dressed up in her good clothes and her good manners, going along making herself mighty agreeable, talking about this and that, cutting her eye up at him real sweet and sticking as close as a burr to a cow's tail. Why, I didn't suppose they would ever be good friends after the trick she played him, said Janie. This happened so long ago, she answered, that after uh, Old Fox plum forgot they ever had any fallings out. You better not pester me anymore. I might forget the tail, clean as a whistle. Well, they went on, him helping her over the foot logs, mighty mannerly, and running on and cracking jokes with her, and at last they got to the house. Mr. Sly Fox's brother, which they called Hungry Billy, because he was all the time eating up folks' chickens. He invited them in and told them to make themselves at home and ask them to stay as long as they can. Miss Molly took off her hat and shawl and she took the ridicule from her arm and lay them on the bed. Then she said, Mr. Hungry Billy, I'm so industrious, I can't bear to be idle even when I'm off on a visit. So please, sir, let me get the supper instead of sitting here holding my hands. Billy told her he didn't care, so she whirled in and set the table and drew the pine tag tea and made the ash cakes. And hungry Billy, he showed her where to get the butter down at the spring. While they were at supper, along came a neighbor and told them that old Mr. Gray Fox was dying and had sent for Billy to sit up with him. So Billy excused himself and asked them to take care of the house until he came back and make themselves right at home. Then he went off with the neighbor. That night when Mr. Fox got to nodding and snogging by the fire, Miss Molly, she slipped out to the spring and ate up the butter down to the very last smidgen and then set to and licked the crock until it was as clean as if it had been scoured. Then she licked her mouth and whiskers clean and came in and sat down by the fire again before Fox had time to wake up and miss her. She sat there looking as innocent as a lamb, going on with her knitting and humming a tune just as if she had never had butter on her mind nor in her mouth. Next morning, hungry Billy came back, cross and sleepy from the sitting up, and when he went down to the spring to get the butter for breakfast, there sat the crock, empty as a gourd. I let you know he was mad. He came a huffin' and a puffin' up to the house, and he says, this here is a nice howdy-do. You all call yourselves respectable folks and come here and squat down on me, and then when I turn my back, you eat up every wrap and scrap of butter you can find in the place. I've been thinking you all were folks, and now I find you were hogs. And with that, he turned his back on both and went flouncing out the door. They followed him, declaring they didn't know anything at all about the butter. And Miss Molly, she did enough talking for both, she did. She says, it wasn't me, sir, indeed it wasn't. I crossed my heart. What would I want with your butter anyways? I've got plenty of butter at home. I don't have to go to the neighbors for every little old snack or vittles I want. Besides that, I've got a mite delicate stomach and I can't eat any butter unless I make it myself because I'm not sure if the folks have been right clean and careful in the making of it. That made Hungry Billy madder than before and he says, well, maybe my butter wasn't clean. I don't know about that, but I do know about this. It's clean gone and what's more, one of you two is the person who gone it. I'm going to keep you both right here until I find out which is the thief. Molly, she thought a little, and then she said, Mr. Billy, I'm very sorry this happened, indeed I am, but what's done can't be undone. And so the only thing now is to prove which of us took your butter. If I'm not deceiving myself, I know the sure and certain way to find out which is the thief. Just you go along about your work and let me and Mr. Sly Fox lay down yonder in the sun all day. And when you come back this evening, I bound, you can tell us which of us done ate the butter. How come, says Hungry Billy. That's as easy as rolling off a log, she says. The heat of the sun is going to streak through and draw the grease out. So when you come back, all you have to do is rub your fingers over our stomach, and then you'll know in a jiffy who swallowed your butter. Mr. Slickery Sly Fox agreed to this because he knew he hadn't taken the butter, so he wasn't afraid it would be proved to be him. Hungry Billy, he said it looked mighty reasonable, and he agreed to it too, and went off across the swamp to tend to his work, and left them both there laying in the sun. 
After a while, she said, blinking and batting her eyes like she can't keep them open. Mr. Fox, that sun makes me powerful sleepy. Please excuse me, sir, but I'm just naturally obliged to take a little nap. Fox said he believed he'd take one himself, and he shut his eyes and put his nose down between both jaws and gave his tail a whip or two to drive away the flies, and pretty nigh he was fast asleep. Miss Molly, she watched out of the corner of her eye, and when she saw he was good and sound asleep, she lit up from that without making no noise and struck out for a neighbor's spring and got her a handful of butter. She came tiptoeing back and stooped down and rubbed the butter all over Mr. Fox's stomach, so softly that he couldn't feel it. And then she went and licked her paws clean and laid down in her place again and kept one eye on him. About the time when she suspected Hungry Billy home, she shut her eyes and snored so loudly he heard her clean across the hollow. When he came up to them, they were apparently fast asleep, and Billy, he reached down and ran his hand over Mrs. Molly's stomach, dry as a bone. Then he tried Mr. Slickery Sly Fox, and he brought up his hand covered with crease and smelling loud of butter. Billy was in a terrible taking and made such a fuss that he woke Mr. Fox and fell to accusing him of taking the butter. Old Fox was so surprised to find his stomach covered with butter that he couldn't say anything at all. About then, Miss Molly Cottontail began to stretch and rub her eyes and pretend like she just woke up. She listened to all the goings on and then she commented to make great admiration. I can't believe this if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. I'm certainly scandalized that a friend of mine has taken to stealing, most especially on a visit. I declare to goodness my feelings are so hurt that I can't rightly express myself. And what's more, I can't stay here associating with a common thief. I've got my young family to think about. So long, Mr. Hungry Billy. I hope you're going to give that man a good walloping because he certainly earned it, coming here, putting up on you, and then cleaning out your butter. Next time you get me to go visiting with you, Mr. Slickery Sly Fox, you'll be a heap older and smarter than what you are this minute. With that, she went scooting before she feared if she stayed longer, she might get found out somehow or another. Hungry Billy, he thought a little while, and then he said to Mr. Fox, well, I'm going to let you off this time because you are my kin and I don't want to disgrace you. I don't want to let folks know I've got a thief for a brother, but don't let me catch you in these parts anymore or I'm going to set to work and lamb the, but the butter out of that greasy hide of yours. You hear me talking. Fox, he declared and sweared that he wasn't the thief, but Billy didn't pay any attention to him. Then he'd had half a mind to tell old hungry Billy about all those hen roosts he's robbed, but Billy was so mad already that he kind of feared to do it. So he went sleeking off with his ears down and his tail dragging. And they let me, and they tell me there was a great coolness that sprang up in that family that lasted for some several years, all because of that crock of butter. I let you know, children, it doesn't take much to start a family quarrel, but it takes a heap of time and trouble to patch one up just the same as it does with those holes where little Master Ned snagged in his britches and it never seems the same after the patching either. All right, so moving on, I'm gonna skip us to our folklorist here in the town of Dumfrey. We named the Weems Museum Bots, um, really reflecting the popular and familiar folklorist Mason Locke Weems, AKA Parson Weems. While well, I will save the history lesson for another day, and you probably already heard it from me anyway, uh, his 1800 book on George Washington transformed the president into an American legend of folk hero. From cutting down the cherry tree to throwing a stone across the Rappahannock, we think many of Weems' stories are just stories and not actual historical events. Instead of reading one of the more famous and well-known tales, I have chosen one with an older George Washington. I'll also point to the painting on the screen. This is Grant Wood's depiction of Mason Locke Weems. Note the representation of George Washington. He's a child with an adult head and the enslaved are working in the background. Well, he was stationed at Alexandria with his regiment, the only one in the colony, and of which he was colonel. There happened at this time to be an election in Alexandria for members of assembly, and the contest ran high between Colonel George Fairfax and Mr. Elsie. 
Washington was the warm friend of Fairfax, and a Mr. Payne headed the friends of Elsie. A dispute happening to take place in the courthouse yard, Washington, a thing very uncommon with him, got warm, and which was still more uncommon, said something that offended Payne. Whereupon the little gentleman, who, though but a cub in size, was the old lion in heart, raised his sturdy hickory, and at a single blow, brought our hero to the ground. Several of Washington's officers being present whipped out their cold irons in an instant, and it was believed there would have been murder offhand. To make bad worse, his regiment, hearing how he had been treated, bolted out from their barracks, with every man his weapon in his hand, threatening dread dreadful vengeance on those who had dared to knock down their beloved colonel. Happily for Mr. Payne and his party, Washington recovered, time enough to go out and meet his enraged soldiers. And after thanking them for this expression of their love and assuring them that he was not in the least, he begged them as they loved him or their duty to return peacefully to their barracks. As for himself, he went to his room, generous, generously chastising his imprudence, which had thus struck up a spark that had liked to have thrown the whole town into a flame. Finding on mature reflection that he had been the aggressor, he resolved to make Mr. Payne honorable reparation by asking his pardon on the morrow. No sooner had he made this noble resolution than recovering that delicious gaiety which accompanies good purposes in a virtuous mind, he went to a ball that night and behaved as pleasantly as though nothing had happened. Glorious proof that great souls, like great ships, are not affected by those little puffs which would overset feeble minds with passion or sink them with spleen. The next day he went to a tavern and wrote a polite note to Mr. Payne, whom he requested to meet. Mr. Payne took it for a challenge and repaired to the tavern, not without expecting to see a pair of pistols produced. But what was his surprise on entering the chamber to see a decanter of wine and glasses on the table? Washington arose and in a very friendly manner met him and gave him his hand. Mr. Payne said he, to err is nature, to rectify error is glory. I find I was wrong yesterday, but I wish to be right today. You've had some satisfaction, and if you think that's sufficient, here's my hand, let us be friends. Admirable, oh, excuse me, admirable youth, noble speech. No wonder, since it charms us so, that it had such an effect on Mr. Payne, who from that moment became the most ardent admirer and friend of Washington, and ready at any time for his sake to charge up to a battery of two and 40 pounders. Also with folklore, we can really look into just records such as engagements and wedding announcements. And these are rather short, but I've picked up a few um, that I thought were fun uh, and kind of show the folklore of our area. The first wedding was recorded for Zoa Clifton. Um, they described her wedding, quote, the ceremonies were ushered in with wedding march sung by the assembled campers and the bride and groom to be stood before the rustic altar under the star-spangled banner to be united in the holy bonds of wedlock. The beautiful solemn words of the marriage ceremony were unaccustomed or unaccompanied by the customary strange of the pipe organ. But the murmur of the hidden waters floated upwards, mingled with the gentle crooning of the wind among the treetops, while silvery bird notes wove threads of melody into the woof roof of semi-silence. For Lily Cloud, um, this one seemed a little bit more amusing. Quote, when they returned to Kimball, a heavy snow had fallen, and as they had several miles to walk before getting to the house of Mr. Fox, a brother-in-law of the groom, they started but found the snow too deep for the bride to walk. Mr. Sowers left her at a farmhouse and went for a buggy, and when he came back, he could not find his bride for some time, as he could not tell the house which he had left her. <laughs> and then finally, we have Mr. Hedrick. Well, Mr. W.P. Hedrick and Miss Lily, daughter of Mr. and Mrs. W. Uh, Kinchley of Brentsville, were married in Washington on last Wednesday. It was one of those old fashioned runaways. Her parents opposed the band so strongly that they thought best run away. 
So on Tuesday evening at 11 o'clock, accompanied by his cousins, they drove within a mile of Brentsville, taking a buggy. The brave knight drove to her house, and at a given, given signal, with hat and shoes in hand, she quickly responded, and then the drive for Washington began, which was made in about six hours. The groom is a prosperous young man of our town, and we heartily congratulate him and wish him much happiness. And this, by the way, the book I just read from uh, took uh, quotes from the Manassas Gazette and the journal from the late 1800s, early 1900s, and it is available uh, to borrow in the, re or in the uh, Lee Lansing Research Library. And I also have one other story that I really want to make sure I have time to read. And I don't want to keep you past 1030, as I said, 1030. Um, but this one came from a family and a friend uh, of our families here in Dumfries. And this one involves teetotalers. And I kind of put up a little information on the screen about that. Teetotaling meaning that you abstain from any alcoholic beverage. Uh, this became popular. It didn't kind of start out as such. Uh, people started to abstain just from hard liquor, but eventually a movement abstained from all liquor. Uh, and by the time that this story is recorded, liquor was allowed again. Uh, but the people here in Dumfries, or at least the people we're going to read about, uh, were still not quite drinking. Quote, the use of alcohol was not totally forbidden and was sometimes used for medicinal purposes. In a small cupboard, we kept a bottle of Mogan David wine and a whiskey filled with rock candy called Rock and Rye. A teaspoon of whiskey and tea for colds and flu and a small glass of wine for cramps were considered legitimate uses. The bottles were sequestered in a cabinet with shot and rifle shells, rat poison, and other dangerous items. So the first story I want to tell you is somewhat shocking considering how my aunt and uncle regarded alcohol as a general rule. Myrnie wanted to have a beautiful party for her 25th wedding anniversary. She was famous in the town of Dumfries for entertaining, and she wanted this one to be very special. She wanted to celebrate a quarter century of a happy marriage in a big way. Someone told her that it would be lovely to have champagne punch. They had a recipe and quote, no, it wasn't strong at all. She need not worry about that. And wouldn't the guest want to toast the happy couple? Myrnie was convinced that Elvin Keys was not, and Champagne Punch was included in the plans. She and Elvin, amid a flower gardener, started in early May getting the acre yard in tip-top shape for the party. 100 invitations were sent, the cake ordered, the house cleaned from top to bottom, special clothes purchased, menu planned, the silver polished, tables and chairs borrowed, tablecloths bought. The house hummed with activity for two months before the party. I was five years old that July of 1943 and unceremoniously bustled off to stay with the relatives so I would not be underfoot. The day arrived and it is a day that will live in infamy in the hearts and mind of those who attended. It started at four in the afternoon and was expected to last several hours. However, when the teetotaling Methodists started drinking the delicious punch, the party lasted much longer. At nine, Mary Williams, Myrnie's best friend, ended it by standing on the table and reciting the poem, The Sinking of the Titanic. She followed that by singing through tears all the verses, verses of Nearer My God to Thee. Quote, I just felt she blubbered, and I had to make a tribute to all those poor, poor souls that perished. Then she passed out, and someone caught her as she fell off the table. That broke up the party. Luckily, everyone took this as a good joke. Mary laughed about it the next day though her, through her headache, though she never drank anything stronger after that than coffee or tea. Uh, now this particular reminiscence that was shared, um, the lady also donated a few others. So you'll see that already on our blog, uh, such as talking about the 1918 um, pandemic. And there will be a special Halloween com one coming up soon as well. That was amazing. <laughs> yeah, that is a great story. <laughs> uh, and then one other way to really explore um, folklore is through music. And Virginia is great with folk festivals, although right now things are kind of on hold. Uh, however, I did put up this song from 1916. I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> I, am, I am not a good singer. Um, but I liked this one called She is the Sunshine of Virginia. And it talks about the bluebirds mating, sweeties waiting, 
I'm returning home today. If you got a heart within you, my little girl is bound to win you, just like the sunshine of Virginia. <laughs> there in the Blue Ridge Mountain, in Virginia far away, there my heart is lying, where the pines are sighing, I am longing for the day. When off to church I take her, my little wife for life I'll make her, she'll be my sunshine of Virginia. All the little flowers nod their pretty heads when my sweetie passes by. All the little birdies in the trees, honeybees, hum and sing and everything. And all the little children on their way to school meet her and greet her with a smile. It is any wonder that I love her when like the sunny skies above her, she is the sunshine of Virginia. And you can find other of these as well. And if you are interested in uh, seeing any of the sources I've used or interested in the PowerPoint that I'm presenting right now too, just let me know and I can send that to you. The one story I did skip um, because of time, and I'll just put that up on the screen, uh, did come from American Indian mythology from the Iroquois. And I just wanna emphasize that American Indian in mythology uh, really differed depending upon the indigenous group. They did not necessarily share a unified mythology. So you could see the same character, such as a bear, being a hero in one tale, but not necessarily that great in another one. Uh, the Flying Head is a story that you can find online as well, but if you would like to read this reading, I can make a copy and email you uh, the one that I was going to read from Fearless Girls, Wise Women, and Beloved Sisters. Yeah, I'm desperate for that. <laughs> okay, excellent. <laughs> yeah, the, I love the uh, drawing I found online for it too. Yes, what? It's great. <laughs> So I just want to thank everyone there. Thank everyone for uh, coming and listening. Um, at, again, at, for our members, at our members, uh, we can do virtual tours. We are doing face-to-face -to -face tours. And October is going to be pretty much jam-packed with lots of chances to hear our ghost lore. Uh, it's kind of the only time in the month where I'll do, or only time of the year, I should say, where I'm going to do a lot of ghost lore. Um, but Sunday on uh, October 11th at 1, I will be having a virtual Halloween tea. Uh, this is a paid event, but I do have it discounted for members. And this will be another um, program kind of like this, except it will be an hour. And we're going to discuss the history of Halloween and also things, recipes that you can make and different ideas for your own celebrations in your home if you are uh, not going out and wanting just to kind of find ways to celebrate inside. Um, so I will stop sharing and I will also pause on recording too. Oh, excuse me. I have one question. Yes. Um, are those...